We're glad you're here. Welcome to UNC Charlotte Center City for yet another conversation about important issues and challenges facing our community and, and others. Uh, for those of you I do not have, I, I have not had the pleasure of meeting, I'm Phil Dubois, the Chancellor at UNC Charlotte. And for all of you, we're honored to have you here at our Center City facility to meet Dr. Diane Ravitch and to enjoy, enjoy an evening made possible by our colleagues at TIAA CREF. Uh, in a moment, I will introduce Pam Schneider, who uh, is Director of Institutional Client Services at TIAA CREF. Uh, Pam, uh, we welcome you and your colleagues for the partnership and for the support you've offered over the years for our academic mission, for faculty research, and uh, even for our alumni association. I wanted you to take back with you to your chain of command that our new football stadium uh, remains unnamed. <laughs> uh, but we have made sure there's enough room on the sign for eight letters and a hyphen. Okay. Now this facility at Center City opened just in the fall of 2011 and it's become an important site for big questions seeking complicated answers. We've had Erskine Bowles and Senator Al Simpson here to talk about deficit reduction and the fiscal cliff. We've had presidential scholar Michael Beschloss here to talk about presidential courage, and he did that in September of last year, right before the election. And we hosted several important dialogues here uh, for the Democratic National Convention. And so it's my view that we need to keep meeting like this uh, for these exciting conversations. The death and life of the great American school system is an apt conversation for Charlotte, where our public school system has been the topic of consider considerable media attention and a wide public interest. Like most big city school districts, it's been this, the, the topic of uh, uh, public criticism, but also prestigious awards for innovation and effectiveness. And as Dr. Ravitch notes uh, in her title, public education may be in peril, but the title for her talk tonight seems to hold out hope for the future, a future in which all of us have an interest and an investment. Now, before I step aside to make room for Pam, I have to share an unexpected program note. I know some of you have already been through a fire drill. Uh, the Charlotte Mecklenburg police have also advised us that from 7.30 until 9 o'clock tonight, what a timing this is, so a team from Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department's Training Academy will be testing the city's audible gunfire detection program. <laughs> now, how do you test the audible gunfire detection system? You fire guns into enclosed steel traps. This is planned to take place just a few blocks from here at the Dixie Tavern. <laughs> so I want you to be aware of this. So after the book signing and additional conversation, as you wander out into the streets and to your cars, or maybe up to Dixie's for a nightcap, you heard it correctly, this is a planned gunfire drill. <laughs> Supervised gunfire, which sometimes we don't always have. So to bring greetings from tonight's sponsor and, uh, and uh, as a committed partner of UNC Charlotte, let me introduce uh, Pam Schneider. Uh, as I mentioned, she's from TIAA CREF, and she will be followed by our wonderful Dean of Education, Dr. Mary Lynn Calhoun. Pam. I like the ring of that, TIAA Kreft Stadium, so I'm definitely gonna bring that back. Thank you, Chancellor Dubois, and good evening, everyone. It's such a pleasure to welcome all of you to this very important evening as we hear from our distinguished speaker, Diane Ravitch, and we are so delighted to co-host this, this wonderful event. We have had a long-standing relationship and partnership with UNCC. We're grateful for every opportunity to support the university's outstanding programs, faculty, students, staff events, and to acknowledge always its valuable contributions to the Charlotte community and to this region. 
Now, TIAA CREP, we're a national financial services organization with over $502 billion in combined assets under management. We're the leading provider of retirement services to those who serve in academia, research, medicine, and the cultural fields. For nearly 100 years, our mission has been to ensure the financial well-being of those who dedicate themselves to the benefit and enlightenment of others. I've been proud to be part of TIAA CREF since 1988, and in my current role, I'm a, I manage a team of relationship managers who really are in the trenches serving our institutional clients. And I can tell you that their commitment to the, to the academic community and to the future of, of education has just keeps getting stronger and stronger. We combine the expertise of today's strategies and systems with a century of experience to guide our institutions through all the different continually challenging regulatory, uh, social, and, and certainly economic issues that, that they continue to face, and as I'm sure UNCC would agree. So we're especially honored tonight to welcome Diane Ravitch, who is certainly, as all of you know, a very respected education historian and scholar. Every one of us in this room has a stake in the future of education, and we're all very interested in hearing her perspective on the current crisis in public education. So again, welcome, and thank you all for being here. And now it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Mary Lynn Calhoun, who's going to welcome Diane. Um, and Mary Lynn Calhoun is the UNC Charlotte Dean from the College of Education. So Mary, Mary Lynn. <laughs> Good evening. It's, it's wonderful to be in a room full of people who care about educational outcomes for our children. And I want you to know that the College of Education at UNC Charlotte stands with you as we work together toward the best possible outcomes for our children and youth. Let me mention a logistical item about our work together tonight. Following Dr. Ravitch's remarks, there will be a few minutes for questions. You received note cards as you came in. If you think of questions as the evening progresses, please jot them down legibly on the note cards. And our wonderful doctoral student ushers will collect those and we'll get through as many as we can in the few minutes uh, at the end of our time together. The TIAA CREP lecture was established at UNC Charlotte to bring influential, stimulating, prominent speakers to engage in robust discussions of important issues and to bring together the campus and the community around that discussion. Tonight's speaker could be the poster child for the ideals and goals of the TIAA CREF lecture series. Dr. Diane Ravitch is a fierce advocate for the value of a free public education system as the foundation of American society. And she's been called the most influential education scholar in the country. She is a historian of education at New York University and a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution in Washington, DC. A prolific writer, she's the author of the book that is the focus of tonight's discussion, The Death and Life of the Great American School System, which will be available at a book signing at the, at the end of the presentation tonight. And she has a new book coming out in September 2013 with the title, wait for it, Hoax, The Privatization Movement and the Danger for America's Public Schools. She's received a remarkable array of honors in her professional life. And I won't name any but one, one that really resonates, I suspect, with many of us in this room. She's been named by the National Education Association as the friend of education. Please join me in welcoming Diane Ravitch. Well, thank you so much. I want to thank Tia Kraft for bringing me here and also for taking such good care of my assets. <laughs> <laughs> and, and thank you to uh, everyone at UNC who's been so gracious in uh, the welcome. I particularly enjoyed meeting with students this afternoon and hearing their lively questions and, and having a great exchange with them. Uh, 
And I hope that that shooting doesn't start too soon. <laughs> because I know I'm going to be drowned out by it. I hate to compete with the police department. But uh, this is indeed a very crucial time in American education. I believe that public education itself is at risk in America. It's surely at risk in North Carolina. Uh, we've all been told time and again about the failings of public education. And I'm going to tell you tonight why you shouldn't believe what you've heard. Public education is indeed a cornerstone of any democratic society. It's opened the doors of opportunity for millions of Americans, including me. I'm a graduate of the Houston Public Schools. Public education is a fundamental engine of social progress and social justice. The desegregation movement happened through the public schools. Gender equity happened through the public schools. The inclusion of children with disabilities happened through the public schools. Take them away. And what engine do we have for our social change in the future? If we throw them away, if we throw away our schools, if we privatize them, we put our democracy at risk. Today there is a movement abroad in the country, and it calls itself the reform movement. They call themselves reformers. I call it the corporate reform movement. It seeks to mimic business, but no business would operate the way these folks operate. No business would so demoralize and belittle its employees as these reformers do. This movement is funded by a small number of billionaires, a large number of Wall Street hedge fund managers, and a significant number of anti-government ideologues. And based on misinformation and on pressure from Washington, many states, including your own, are implementing policies that will have the following effects. They will ruin the teaching profession, privatize public education, and reduce the quality of education, all while claiming to be reforming education. Uh, now, your dean mentioned the title of my new book. The title was just settled yesterday in a meeting with my editor, and I turned to the president and I said, hoax. That's subtle, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Scholars are supposed to be subtle, but this is not subtle because what's happening is not subtle. We have a bipartisan consensus around certain claims which I believe to be false, and in some cases, knowingly false. First comes the claim that American education is declining and failing, and these reformers say that we're falling behind the rest of the world, and they say we've made no progress in education for decades, and that our academic performance is flat, but they're wrong. Secondly, the cause of this alleged failure is, they say, it's bad teachers. We have so many bad teachers. If we could just keep firing those bad teachers, then we'll miraculously end up by a process of elimination with a great teacher in every classroom. Everyone will get high test scores and we'll all live happily ever after. Well, that's ridiculous. And third, they say, we sh you should pay no attention to poverty. Anyone who talks about poverty is just making excuses for the bad teachers. That's wrong also. And then they say the solution to our education problems is to open more and more charters, because charters are silver bullets that will fix education and eliminate poverty. Or they say, give everyone a voucher uh, to go to a religious or a private school, and there's no evidence for these claims. And I'll talk about the evidence in a minute. And then they say, they don't say it, but this is what they're doing, and that is they're destroying the teaching profession, uh, such as with the legislation introduced the other day by Senator Berger in your state, uh, which will actually lower standards for entry into teaching, remove any right to due process, demoralize teachers, turn teaching from a profession into just a job based on test scores of dubious value in many cases. And then also these reformers, this has happened in state after state, want to weaken or neutralize local school boards. They say that local school boards have too much discussion and debate, and we're in a hurry. We can't wait to talk about what we're doing. They want omnipotent governors and omnipotent state superintendents who can impose privately managed charters on districts whether or not they want them. They want national standards and national tests so the federal government can 
control education without any local discussion or input from teachers. And this is just their way of saying that they don't like democratic control of public education. But all of these things that I've described, these six points, this has nothing to do with reform. This is a step-by-step -step recipe for the privatization of public education. And that's the narrative that you hear on national television when you hear people like Michelle Rhee. It's the narrative in movies like Waiting for Superman or uh, Won't Back Down. Uh, it's wrong, it's factually wrong, and it's a smear job on our public schools. So I want to talk about the evidence, facts. I like facts. As John Adams said, facts are stubborn things. Ronald Reagan even quoted him, facts are stubborn things. The only tests that have been given over many years, the only one with a longitudinal trend line, are the federal tests called the National Assessment of Educational Progress. It's called NAEP. I served on the governing board. I was appointed by President Clinton twice. Uh, to, the governing board is the National Assessment Governing Board. It supervises NAEP. And NAEP has been testing scientific samples of American students since the early 1970s, four decades. It's been testing state by state since 1992. Here are some facts that you need to know. On NAEP, over the past 20 years, and that's when the state testing began, North Carolina has made impressive gains in fourth grade reading. Eighth grade reading scores flat, but in mathematics, North Carolina has made dramatic progress in both fourth grades and eighth grades, outpacing the gains of most other states. Now you might wonder why the difference in reading and in math. Reading is largely reflective of home circumstances, home vocabulary. Math is taught purely, or almost purely, in schools. North Carolina public schools, North Carolina teachers, have made incredibly impressive gains in fourth and eighth grade mathematics. Public education is working in North Carolina. This has happened despite the fact that more than half the students in North Carolina live in poverty. This has happened despite the fact that the legislature has cut the funding for public education. North Carolina is now 48th in the nation in spending on public education. Teacher salaries in North Carolina are 46 in the nation. These are sorry statistics for a state that was once touting its record as being the most progressive of all the southern states and a state that wanted good public schools. It's hard to keep moving forward when schools don't have the resources they need to function properly. And when good teachers quit because they can't afford to feed their family and pay their mortgage, and because they feel disrespected, as so many North Carolina teachers do today. So comes the question, is, public, is American public education declining, as we so often hear on television from these reformers? The simple answer is no. And here's the shocker. And when my book comes out, it's going to have pages and pages and pages of graphs in it, all drawn from US government statistics. The test scores for American students today at their highest, are at their highest point in history. I think I should say that again and again and again, because you'll not hear this on any of the TV programs. The test scores of white students, black students, Hispanic students, and Asian students are at their highest point in history. Graduation rates are at their highest point in history. Among young people from the ages of 18 to 24, 90% have a high school diploma. The corporate reformers will not tell you that. Maybe they don't know it. They don't count the kids who graduate in August. They only count the kids who graduate in June after four years. They don't count the students who took five years to get a degree. They don't count the GEDs, but the Census Bureau does. Among white youth, 18 to 24, the graduation rate is 94%. Among black youth, it's 87%. Among Hispanic youth, it's 77%. Hispanic youth include many who are new immigrants, who are not in high school, but in the workforce. Dropout rates, remember, you know, the, we've all heard about the dropout crisis. Dropout rates are at their lowest point in history. Among those between the ages of 16 and 24 who are not in high school, only 8% do not have a high school diploma. It's the lowest dropout rate in history. These reformers say that they want to close the achievement gap, which of course we would all like to do, but what they don't know I assume they don't know it, because if, if they know it and aren't admitting it, it would be awful, is that the biggest narrowing of the black-white achievement gap occurred in the 19, late 1970s and early 1980s. 
long before No Child Left Behind and Race to the Top. So what was happening during that period? That's when the federal courts ordered racial desegregation. That was the time of greater economic opportunities for African American families. That was the time when states and districts reduced class sizes. And that was a time of increased participation in early childhood education programs. So you have to wonder, if we're serious about reducing the racial achievement gap, why aren't we doing what we know worked? We should do more of it. But what about our terrible performance on international tests? And you often see people on television saying, we're 19th at this and 12th at that and whatever number they throw out. Why are we only in the middle of the pack? Why aren't we number one? Didn't we used to be number one? We think we should, we think we were, but here's the facts. When the first international assessment was given in 1964, 12 nations took it. We took, it, uh, took that test in two different grades. We came in 12th out of 12 in one grade and 11th out of 12 in the other grade. In the past 50 years, there have been many international tests, and our students typically have scored either in the bottom quartile or about average. But over the past half century, our nation has far surpassed all of the others who had higher test scores in terms of economic growth, military strength, technological innovation, democratic institutions, creativity, what, <clears throat> whatever measure you want to come up with, uh, we outperform the nations with higher scores. The test scores do not predict anything about the future performance of our economy. What matters most for our economy and our society is not the ability to pick the right bubble on a standardized test, but the creativity, the ingenuity, and the risk-taking that is encouraged by a free society. That happens to be where we excel or where we have excelled, our current obsession with standardized testing is crushing creativity, ingenuity, and risk-taking, the very things that we need for success in the 21st century. There is, however, one statistic where we are unquestionably number one among the advanced nations of the world. We have more children living in poverty than any other advanced nation in the world. Almost a quarter of our children are below the po poverty line as compared to less than 5%, say, in Finland. That has a huge impact on test scores. Wherever there's concentrated poverty, there are low test scores. Here's a fact you should know about standardized testing. On every standardized test, be it the SAT, the, a the, the ACT, the state test, the NAEP, or the international test, the children from the wealthiest homes usually score at the top and the children who grew up in poverty usually score at the bottom. This is, a, this is a fact, it's not a judgment. This is not because those at the top are smarter, but because they have more advantages in life. They have better health care, they have educated parents, they have a home computer, they have safe neighborhoods, they have books in the home, they have a library card, they, they travel, they have all the advantages that money can buy. Some poor kids manage to succeed despite all the obstacles, but let's not kid ourselves. The deck is stacked against them. On every standardized test, the poor kids cluster in the bottom. This is not an American issue. This is true in every nation. These reformers, the corporate reformers, like to say that they are putting children first. I think that when anybody starts talking children first, students first, kids first, you must immediately understand they don't mean it. Because what they're saying is they're putting children and students in opposition to teachers and to somebody else. And we don't need opposition, we need collaboration. They say they're leading, this is, to me is the most obnoxious of all claims, they say they're leading the civil rights issue of our day. I have a hard time understanding how Wall Street hedge fund managers and billionaires are leading the civil rights <laughs> issue of our day. But if your primary interest truly is equity and civil rights, why would you insist on using standardized tests as the one true measure of success? There are many ways to be successful in life, and getting high scores on standardized tests measure only one of those ways. Standardized tests are a mirror of socioeconomic status. They measure achievement gaps. They do not close them. 
Every standardized test is normed on a bell curve. Every bell curve has a top half and a bottom half. The bottom half is always populated by the children who are poorest and have the fewest opportunities. Why not ditch the bell curve and focus on improving opportunities? That would be innovative. Why not treat every child as a unique individual with undeveloped talents? Standardized tests are not, never have been, and never will be an instrument to advance civil rights or to end poverty. If we were really concerned about helping kids in poverty, why would we give priority to the one measure that always puts them at the bottom? That's wrong. So let's look at the two biggest reform programs of our day. And I use the term reform ironically. In 2001, Congress passed No Child Left Behind, and CLB was based on Governor George W. Bush's claim about a Texas miracle. And as president, uh, Bush signed it into law in January of 2002. He said that there was a simple formula to raise test scores, to raise graduation rates, and to close the achievement gap, test every child every year, publish the results, reward the successful schools, and embarrass those that weren't raising test scores, and that makes everyone try harder, and that's how you fix education. Well, we've had 11 years of that, and not only has it not worked nationally, but now we know there was no Texas miracle. Now, I grew up in Texas. There, we have something in Texas called tall tales. And this was a tall tale. The pressure to get higher test scores every year has caused cheating. It's caused teaching to bad test. It's caused schools and districts to fudge the data and to game the system. It's made a few testing corporations very, very rich. But now the whole country is stuck with a federal law based on carrots and sticks, and it doesn't work. High stakes testing is driving all the other ports, parts of the corporate reform agenda. The biggest revolt against high stakes testing is taking place right now in Texas, where it all started. More than 80% of the local school boards in Texas have passed a resolution opposing high stakes testing. Uh, both Republicans and Democrats in the Texas state legislature want to scale back the amount of testing. Right now, the kids have to pass 15 tests in order to graduate, and um, people are, the representatives are being buttonholed in their supermarket and their barber shop by parents saying, how are you doing this? This makes no sense. They're beginning to get it. So they're talking about scaling it back. Uh, I was very impressed that Charlotte Mecklenburg's superintendent, Heath Morrison, took a strong stand against standardized testing and the overemphasis on testing uh, it, soon after he got here. I read his interview in the uh, Charlotte Observer. And uh, I'm also thrilled to see that parents in Charlotte have organized a group called Mecklenburg Acts, in which they are, <laughs> in which they're organizing parents uh, to make them aware of how pernicious all this testing is. It's not necessary. We don't need to be testing kids constantly. It takes time away from instruction. In many of our schools across the nation, testing and test prep now consumes 20% of the school year. Some places even more than that. That's time taken away from teaching and, and learning. The teachers at Garfield High School in Seattle unanimously refused to give the test. Students at Port in Portland, Oregon have announced that they're going to boycott the state test. Uh, the Providence Student Union in Rhode Island uh, staged a zombie protest in front of the State Education Department uh, because the State Education Department in Rhode Island decided to take a standardized test, which is normed on a bell curve, and use it as a graduation test and to say you can't graduate. Well, we know by the nature of the bell curve that nearly half the students are not going to pass it. They will not graduate. That's wrong. And so the students had to come up with an even better idea, which they did. They invited accomplished professionals to take the test. And they took released items from the math part of the uh, New England assessment, which th they were going to be required to take. And they found 50 accomplished professionals, people who are architects, engineers, pro uh, professors, and so forth, who took the test last Saturday. Uh, and these were all released math items. And 60% of them failed. <laughs> um, this is all crazy. I mean, we've gone nuts with testing. It's all about not trusting teachers to make a professional judgment. Parents know that the tests don't make their children smarter. 
Superintendents know that this obsession with testing is driving bad educational policy. School boards know it too. Students know it. Everyone seems to know it, except Congress, the US Department of Education, the governors and the state legislatures. They want data, they want more and more data. And meanwhile, the NCLB, the No Child Left Behind deadline draws nearer. No Child Left Behind mandates that 100% of all students will be proficient in math and reading by the year 2014. Now that sounded like a really good idea back in 2001. <laughs> um, but the bad news is it's 2013. 2014 is coming up pretty fast. It's right around the corner. Very few schools can claim that 100% of their students are proficient. In fact, there's no nation in the world where 100% of students are proficient. Not anywhere in the world. No other national legislature has ever passed a law that was determined and bound to label almost every public school in its nation a failure. But that's what Congress, in its wisdom, decided to do. I went to a panel discussion soon after the passage of No Child Left Behind, and I spoke to uh, Senator Lamar Alexander, who had been my boss when I worked in the, in the Department of Education. I had been the Assistant Secretary in charge of research. And so I asked him, uh, do you really believe that by 2014, 100% of the children in this country will be proficient? He said, no, but you know, it's good to have goals. Well, it is good to have goals, but we're closing schools across America based on a goal that no one believes in. I just learned by email a few minutes ago that uh, the mayor of Chicago is closing 50 elementary schools. It's the most number of public schools ever closed in one fell swoop. Uh, schools are closing in Philadelphia, they're closing in Indianapolis, they're closing in, they're closing in cities across America. Of course, if you wanted to reform schools, the last place you would go and ask them to do it uh, would be the Congress. What do they know about reforming schools? Uh, the second last place would be the U.S. Department of Education. Now, I worked in the U.S. Department of Education. I have great respect for the people that work there. They are really good at doing the grants and contracts, but they're not educators. Uh, and now they're telling everybody how to run their schools. Maybe there's a worse place. Maybe it's the state legislature. <laughs> Mandating teachers, telling teachers how to teach and what to teach, as if they knew. No Child Left Behind says that if your school is not on track to meet this unrealistic goal, then the school must be punished. If you don't meet the goal for five straight years, everyone in the school might be fired, your school might be closed, it might be turned over to private management, it might be taken over by the state. Now bear in mind that not a one of these remedies had an ounce of evidence behind it in 2001 when the law was passed. 11 years have passed, 12, oh, not quite 12 years. There is still no evidence for any of these supposed remedies. The consequences of No Child Left Behind have been ugly. Long ago, teaching to the test was considered unprofessional. It was something that good teachers would never do. Under NCLB, teaching to the test became a necessity. It became routine. Districts and states are now investing hundreds of millions of dollars in testing and test preparation materials. All over the nation, schools are spending more time on test prep with less time for instruction. This is simply educational malpractice. Schools have cut back on the arts. Some elementary schools have dropped the arts altogether. They just don't have time for them. Some have eliminated recess. Even though the evidence is clear that children need physical activity, they need time to play, they need time to run around and blow off steam. Some schools have reduced the time available for history or for civics, even for science. What matters most is the scores on the state test of math and reading because they determine whether your school will live and die. And the heart and soul of good education is being sacrificed on the altar of high stakes testing. Some districts have encouraged or ignored cheating on a massive scale. The two biggest cheating scandals in recent years were in Atlanta and in Washington, DC. The governor of Georgia hired independent investigators who uncovered widespread and systematic cheating in Atlanta. Many people were fired and held accountable. USA Today published an expose of cheating in more than half the public schools in the District of Columbia during the tenure of Chancellor Rhee. The answers were changed on the bubble sheets from wrong to right at a startling rate. 
One school that won praise and bonuses had an amazing erasure rate. In one seventh grade class, there were more than 12 wrong to write erasures on almost every answer sheet, whereas the average for all DC schools was less than one. And as USA Today put it, the odds are better for winning the Powerball grand prize than had, having that many erasures by chance. But after the test scores at that school soared from 10% proficient to 58% proficient, Chancellor re-promoted the principal and put him in charge of training other principals. She published ads for new principals saying, quote, are you the next Wayne Ryan? And soon after the USA Today story was published, Mr. Ryan quietly resigned. But unlike Atlanta, there were no consequences and no accountability in the District of Columbia. There was a whitewash. So this is the bitter fruit of No Child Left Behind, which is still the law of the land. Teaching to the test, narrowing the curriculum, score inflation, gaming the system, and cheating, and more. Bringing chaos and disruption to school districts, closing schools, shattering communities, firing staff, and laying the groundwork for privatization. So along comes the next big reform initiative, Race to the Top. It is built firmly on the flawed foundation of No Child Left Behind. My condolences, you won. You got North Carolina won a Race to the Top grant. So you get to do everything that Secretary Duncan wants you to do. Like No Child Left Behind, Race to the Top insists that test scores are the be all and end all of education. Like NCLB, Race to the Top uses test scores for carrots and sticks. Race to the Top is NCLB on steroids. Like NCLB, Race to the Top assumes that the federal government knows best how to reform the nation's schools. Use the Chicago model, it's working there, right? NCLB promised to punish schools, Race to the Top promises to punish teachers in schools. And like NCLB, Race to the Top offers a menu of mandates and reforms that has not a shred of evidence to prove that they work or that they will ever work. These federal mandates are expensive. Implementing the mandates of Race to the Top will cost the state many times more than the money that the federal government provides. And the mandates will not improve education. To be eligible to get some of that federal cash, states had to pledge to evaluate teachers by student test scores. In some states, student test scores count for as much as 50% of teacher evaluations. But here's the odd part about that requirement. No one has ever demonstrated that doing this will improve education. There's no evidence for this way of evaluating teachers. There are better ways. Some districts are reporting that their very best teachers got low ratings. Houston fired its Teacher of the Year. This makes no sense at all. Teachers are rated based on whether their student scores go up or down. Value-added assessment was pioneered in Tennessee by William Sanders in the 1990s, the early 1990s. If value-added assessment was the key to having the best education in the world, Tennessee ought to have it already. It doesn't. It's been doing value-added assessment longer than anyone else, but it's nowhere near the top. On the NAEP test, it's right in the middle. I forget if it's just above or just below North Carolina, but its scores have improved no more than any other state. Now understand that Sanders is an agricultural statistician. And as I read his theory, children are kind of like corn. <laughs> if you plant it, if you have the right soil and the right nutrients, it should grow a certain amount every year. If it doesn't, it must be the farmer's fault. Now, farmers have things to contend with like weather and pests and blight, but that's nothing compared to what teachers face. Some teachers see students for several hours a day. Some see them for 45 minutes a day. Some teach subjects like art or music or physical education that aren't tested. Before students arrive in their classrooms, they've already been shaped by their home and their communities. They have emotional and social issues that interfere with their studies. They have family crises that interfere with their studies. And of course, teachers make a difference. Of course, teachers change lives. But what the family does or does, not, or does not do for children determines children's futures even more than what their teachers do. Everyone seems to know that except the people who created Race to the Top. Study after study has demonstrated that value-added assessment is inaccurate and unstable, 
A teacher with a high rating one year may get a low rating the next year. A teacher with a low rating this year may get a high rating the next year. If you switch the test, the ratings will change. Good teachers will be fired. Mediocre teachers who drill to the test will get a bonus. Testing experts say that value-added assessment, which is the heart and soul of Race to the Top, reflect which students are in the classroom, not teacher quality. Those who teach students with severe disabilities are likely to get a low score, as are teachers of children who are English language learners, as are teachers of the gifted. Why teachers of the gifted? Their children arrive already with very high scores. It's hard to get them higher. I'll give you an example from my grandson's public school in Brooklyn. The children in the gifted class arrived in the school with an average of 3.92, the top score is a four. The computer said they should leave with a 3.97. They left with a 3.95, and the computer said that she was an ineffective teacher. Based on two one hundredths of a point, that's probably less than one question per student that was answered wrong, if, if any. Uh, but she can't get, she, if, if they're layoff, she'll be the first to be laid off. And the principal told me she's a great teacher. It's a nutty system. It's a stupid system. Uh, my, uh, uh, I got an email right before I came in from a teacher in a rural school district in North Carolina who said, we figured out how to take care of this fam problem. He said, in our little rural district, it came to us late. And then I started meeting with teachers in the suburban schools, and I understood what you do. When they do the testing in September, you do everything possible to distract the students. You play loud music, you make noises, you have lots of things going on. You try to get the lowest possible score in September, and then when they test them again at the end of the year, it's quiet, it's orderly, have little hints around the classroom, scores go up, you're successful. Bang. The, uh, the other teacher I heard from who gave, me, gave a wonderful answer was she said she taught Latin. And she said, uh, you know, it's easy in Latin to get a high VAM score because in September they don't know any Latin. <laughs> <laughs> and by the end of the year, they know some Latin. <laughs> Everybody's improved. And what's even better is that when they come to check your test, the people who are doing the evaluation can't read them anyway. <laughs> So value, here's the thing about value-added assessment. It's not worked anywhere. We've been doing this now, trying to do it, because of race at the top, since 2009, 2010. Hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent in district after district by the US Department of Education and the Gates Foundation. It hasn't worked anywhere. It's caused chaos. It's called, caused dissension with good teachers getting low scores and you know, all kinds of rating problems. We're all trying to make it work, and it doesn't work. And guess what? No other nation in the world is even attempting to do this. It's a stupid way of evaluating teachers. It will not work because it was cooked up by statisticians and economists to measure productivity. But education cannot be measured in such a crude fashion. Education is far more than a bubble on a test. Education involves not just the mind, but the heart and the will. It's not just about intellect, it's about character. It's about a slow and steady process of human development. Frankly, standardized tests are not even a good measure of intellect. The thoughtful student may pick the wrong answer because they thought too hard about it, not the obvious answer. They're supposed to guess what did the test maker want them to think, and they spend too much time thinking. Standardized tests are prone to error. The questions may have more than one right answer, depending on how much you know. I've seen standardized test questions where the right answer struck me as wrong. Uh, standardized tests are not like a yardstick. They're not scientific instruments. They're not a barometer. They're not a thermometer. They're a cultural product. The only thing standardized about them is that they're scored by computers. The questions are written by human beings. The answers are written by human beings and they're filled with error. They're prone to statistical error, random error, human error, uh, on and on, and yet we are tying students' futures and teachers' lives to these flawed products. This is wrong. So teachers are being judged by a scheme that is untried, unworthy, and hapless, and has never been proven to work anywhere, and we're doing it across the nation. Of course, teachers should be evaluated. And there are districts that have figured out realistic and professional ways to do it. 
The best that I know of is the Peer Assistance and Review Program in Montgomery County, Maryland. And there, uh, the process works like this. A master teacher is assigned to work with every new teacher, and also a master teacher is assigned to work with every veteran teacher who gets a low rating from the principal. The teachers who need help get it. Those who can't improve and those who won't improve are asked to leave. Uh, there's a review committee consisting of teachers and principals uh, which reviews the recommendations of the mentors, and it has fired hundreds of teachers. The system is professional. It does not rely on test scores. It relies on the professional judgment of educators. Well, another of the truly uh, bad ideas that's being promoted now by the carrot and stick crowd is merit pay. Uh, and it, the legislation that was introduced just uh, in the last day or two by Senator Berger uh, will tie teachers' pay to test scores. This is not a new idea. But it certainly, uh, it, it sounds logical, doesn't it, that if you t pay teachers more, the kids will get higher test scores. Although I remember Albert Shanker, who was the president of the American Federation of Teachers, asked this question. He said, now, let me get this. If you pay the teachers more, the students will work harder? How does that work? <laughs> um, but anyway, it, it sounds pretty simple, except that it doesn't work. It's been tried now for almost 100 years. It's never worked, not anywhere. It's been evaluated again and again, and it has never worked, but it never dies. Uh, the most thorough test of merit pay was done at Vanderbilt University. An economist there carried out a rigorous, carefully reviewed study. They said, well, the reason that merit pay had never worked in the past was the bonuses were never big enough to get those lazy teachers to work hard. So they offered a bonus of $15,000 to teachers who could raise math scores. And they had an experimental group, and they had a control group. And in September 2010, they released the results of a very careful study and discovered that the bonus made no difference. Both groups got the same scores. Now, my hunch is that both groups were teaching the best they knew how. The cash prize did not make one group work harder or teach better. There were not teachers that were saying, if I only were offered a cash prize, I'd bring out my best teaching methods. So about the same time that the Nashville plan failed, New York City admitted that its merit pay plan also failed. That plan gave a bonus not to individual teachers, but to the entire school if the scores went up. And the city blew away more than $50 million handing out bonuses to schools, which was not a bad thing, except that an evaluation by the Rand Corporation showed that it didn't make a difference, that schools eligible for the bonus and not eligible for the bonus were making the same uh, gains, so it was irrelevant. Chicago tried merit pay for four years and recently admitted that it too had failed. But failure doesn't change the minds of people who believe in merit pay because what we have today in education is faith-based policy, not evidence-based policy. The US Department of Education, in the face of all of these dismal results, has committed $1 billion for new merit pay programs. They never give up, never, never. The mayor of New York City says he wants to try merit pay again. This time, he wants a bonus of $20,000. He wants to try the merit pay plan that failed in Nashville. So this is why I call merit pay the idea that never works and never dies. Uh, you will soon be seeing merit pay attached to uh, scores in North Carolina. Tennessee is about to adopt merit pay. It just never goes away and it never works. Uh, teachers hate merit pay, by the way. They don't want to compete with one another for an annual bonus. They know that the schools work best when people work together. And they know that merit pay destroys collaboration and teamwork. This is exactly what the business guru, W. Edwards Deming, said about performance pay in the corporate world. He said that Performance pay undermines the corporate culture. It gets everyone thinking only about himself and not about the long-term good of the corporation. Everyone focus on, focuses on himself or herself and only on short-term goals, not on long-term goals. If the corporation is unsuccessful, he said, it's the fault of the system and not the workers in it. It is management's job to recruit the best workers, to train them well, to support them, and to create an environment in which they can take joy in their work. Can you imagine that, having as your goal joy in your work? That's what most people want, 
Account accountability begins not at the bottom. Accountability begins at the top. That's where the decisions are made. Race to the top expects states to close down low-performing schools, fire the staff, and start over. This is called a turnaround. I have a little problem with this word turnaround. I think, I think of the word turnaround, and I think of children dancing around a maypole. It sounds like such a happy word, but it's not happy. It's mean. There's no evidence that when you close schools, that the new schools are better than the old schools, unless they don't let, allow in the children who were in the old schools. When I was in Louisiana last week, and the state the head of the state education board was explaining what they were doing, one of the questioners said, you close the failing schools and you give them to someone new and they get new students. Why don't they take the, the, the failing students with the failing schools? It's a game that's being played. It's a shell game. It's a hoax. The main thing that closing schools does is to destroy neighborhood schools and to destabilize communities. After nearly 20, 20 years of nonstop reform, Chicago remains one of the lowest performing urban districts in the nation. And furthermore, it has more youth violence than any other big city. Many critics in Chicago attribute the spike in youth violence and the youth murders, many unbelievable numbers of young people killed, to the closing of neighborhood schools and to the fact that many young uh, children are crossing from one area to another, uh, from one gang territory to another. The teacher strike in Chicago last September was not about money. It was about teachers saying, enough is enough. The teachers said, give our students the libraries, the social workers, the teachers of the arts that they need. Give them smaller classes. Give them the support to succeed. And Mayor Emanuel gave his answer today. He's closing 50 more schools and opening charters. He says the schools are underutilized. Why are they underutilized? Because he's opened so many charters to drain kids out of them. And the charters are doing no better than the public schools. But charter schools are, today, the silver bullets. We're supposed to believe that if we replace public schools with privately managed schools, we'll see some kind of renaissance. That's what the program in Chicago was called. It was called Renaissance 2010. Well, it's 2013, and there still has not been a renaissance in Chicago. But the evidence about charter schools is clear. Some charter schools get high test scores. Some get low test scores. On average, they do not get better scores than public schools. Some of those that get high test scores do it by skimming the most motivated students or excluding children with disabilities or children who are English language learners. Some of them have high attrition rates. Some of them kick out low performing students. Some of them get their high scores by drilling students to take the test. Unfortunately, if the children are given a test they didn't practice for, they can't answer the questions. They're just learning to take that test. There are some good charter schools, but unfortunately the uh, charter sector has become very entrepreneurial, very aggressive, and is in its competitiveness is in many cases seeking to push out public education. Uh, so we have the myth and the spin surrounding New Orleans. New Orleans is supposed to be the place that proves that charters are the answer. More than 80% of the children in New Orleans are in charter schools, and it's often held up as a miracle story. But what the corporate reformers never tell you is that there are some 70 districts in the state of Louisiana and New Orleans ranks 69th out of 70. But what they'll say is, but we, look at the progress we've made. But they don't tell you that 79% 79 79 of the charters were graded by the state either a D or an F. There is lots of choice, but most of the choices are bad choices. There is lots of choice, but there's not much equality of educational opportunity. Perhaps the most invidious aspect of the charter movement is the growth of for-profit charters. Before 1990, there was no such thing as a for-profit public school in the United States, and now they're proliferating. Some 80% of the charters in the state of Michigan are for-profit charters. Some states, in theory, don't have for-profit charters, like Ohio, but the law allows a nonprofit charter to hire a for-profit management company. One of the for-profit managers in Ohio has collected nearly a billion dollars in taxpayer funding since his corporation started managing charters in 1999. None of his schools have ever received a grade higher than a C. Most have received a D or an F. 
but they never get closed down because the owner of this particular for-profit corporation is one of the biggest donors to the election campaigns of the governor and the legislature. So the worst of the for-profit charter schools are the virtual schools. They typically come into a state by hiring lobbyists, making generous campaign contributions. Their rhetoric is all about innovation, personalization, customization, 21st century learning. They advertise heavily. They locate themselves in the poorest district in the state so that they can claim the highest reimbursement for tuition. The district gets a commission and the online corporation takes in big profits. Now, you're very fortunate in North Carolina because the North Carolina school boards got onto this game and they blocked K-12 from coming into, uh, into North Carolina. They blocked them in court. K-12 is the biggest of these for-profit online charter companies. These online charters recruit students statewide and when they do, they take away students and the money from every district in the state. They impoverish public education. Uh, and at the same time, they're terrible schools. They're not even really schools. It's just homeschooling, with, with, and they give you a computer and materials. They have a very high attrition rate. About half the kids who enroll drop out every year, which means that they must continually recruit to keep up their enrollment and their cash flow. When the students drop out, the students return to the public school, and the money stays with the corporation. So it's good business for them. But this, there have been many studies now about the for-profit online schools, they make a lot of money and the students do terribly. They get very low test scores, they have very low graduation rates, and the biggest of these online corporations, K-12, is listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Its president, whose background is McKinsey and Goldman Sachs, is paid $5 million a year. Kind of like your typical superintendent. <laughs> well, most of these virtual schools don't make a AYP, adequate yearly progress, which is the measure under No Child Left Behind. In Pennsylvania, which is a virtual charter school heaven, there are now 16 charter corporation, virtual charter corporations operating. Um, and that's the whole political story behind that. I think it's a, one of the high-level high state executives used to work for K-12. Uh, but only one of the virtual charter schools has ever made AYP. If they were really public schools, most of them would have been shut down by now. Another idea that has recently joined the parade of failed innovations is vouchers. Uh, you may have noticed that they're seldom called vouchers. They're called, usually called opportunity scholarships. Now there's a reason they're called opportunity scholarships. It's because the word vouchers just doesn't poll well. Voters don't like vouchers. Voters understand vouchers mean that kids can take public money and go to a private or religious school, and voters don't want the, to do that, and so every time Vouchers have been, have been put to a test at the polls they've lost. The most recent loss was in Florida in this past election, November 2012, where I think they called it something like a Religious Freedom Act, but it was vouchers. And it was turned, the Religious Freedom Act was turned down by 58% of the voters in Florida. Voters don't like vouchers. Uh, so, but there are several of these programs operating now in several districts and states. The most venerable or the oldest of them is Milwaukee, and we can learn a lot from Milwaukee. Milwaukee adopted vouchers in 1990, uh, and the claim was that it would save poor minority students from failing public schools. Cleveland has had vouchers since 1998. Congress created a voucher program in Washington, D.C. in 2003. And the one common fact about these three voucher programs is that they've had no effect on test scores, zero. Their, their advocates don't even claim that they've had an effect on test scores, not in any of these cities. Milwaukee, which has now had vouchers for 22 years, now has three competing school sectors. And you know, you always hear this mantra about competition is going to improve, cause schools to work harder and better, and uh, the competition will cause good things to happen. Here's what you need to know about Milwaukee. Black students in Milwaukee have low scores in all three sectors, uh, whether it's charter, voucher, or, or the public sector. Milwaukee, the district Milwaukee, is one of the lowest performing districts in the nation. On the NAEP, it ranks slightly above Detroit. All that competition and choice did nothing to raise scores. It simply divided community effort into three sectors, all of which do poorly. Imagine if all that money, that billion dollars or so that's now been spent on vouchers had gone into improving the public schools for all the children. So there are two big questions to ask about today's so-called reform movement. 
First is, why are these reformers so determined to privatize public education? Why do they think that privatization will produce better education when there is no evidence that it's true? Uh, the most likely result of privatization, in my view, will be the reestablishment of a dual school system with privately managed charters for motivated students and public schools as dumping grounds for everyone else. In some cases, the intention behind the charters is racial, and, and I've had people say this to me in various contexts. Uh, it's simply a way of um, white flight uh, subsidized by the government. Secondly, why don't we do the things that are supported by research? Since everything I've described to you as reform has no research, no evidence, and experience shows that it doesn't work. Why don't we make sure, just for starters, and I'm going all the way back to the beginning, why don't we make sure that every poor woman gets good prenatal care? Women who don't get good prenatal care are likely to have preterm babies with the risk of cognitive deficiencies and developmental delays. The March of Dimes released a study just last year showing that we have the worst record of any developed nation in the world in providing prenatal care. So when they stand up and say, look, we're number 12th, 14th, or whatever in test scores, we're like number 134th in providing prenatal care for women in this country. We rank alongside countries like Somalia in providing prenatal care. Instead of paying for medical care upfront, we pay for it with special education spending that way exceeds the original cost for many years into the future, and we ignore the evidence, which is clear. Why don't we invest in early childhood education? Among the developed nations of the world, we're number 24 in providing it. The res research on the value of high-quality preschool is overwhelming. The achievement gap begins before the first day of school. Why don't we start to narrow it long before kindergarten? If we truly wanted to raise achievement in every school, we would make sure that every child gets a regular medical checkup and that every school has a nurse. 100 years ago, our urban centers opened health clinics for the children of poor immigrants. Why do we now neglect the health of our children? If we want to reduce the achievement gap, why don't we reduce class sizes in the early grades? The research on class size is overwhelmingly powerful. When children are in smaller classes, they learn more. Yet we see school districts across the nation increasing class sizes. In Detroit, the so-called reform plan will lift class size in the early grades to 40, and as high as 60 in high school. This is nuts. Real reformers would be fighting it, not implementing it. If we cared about the quality of education, we would insist that every school have a balanced curriculum and that every school offered a full program in the arts. Children have to have a reason to want to come to school, not just to be tested. Good education includes not just basic skills, but history and civics, literature, sciences, foreign languages, advanced courses in math and science. A great education gives students the opportunity to sing, to dance, to write, to act, to play instruments, to march, to sculpt, to design, and to dream. Students need a reason to come to school, not as drudgery, not as duty, but for the joy that comes from performance and imagination. If we cared about the civil rights issue of our day, we would stop ignoring segregation and poverty. There's now powerful evidence. <laughs> There's powerful evidence that desegregation benefits black children. Recent studies from Rucker Johnson, economist at Berkeley, show that black students who attended desegregated schools for at least five years had higher test scores, higher graduation rates, higher college graduation rates and led healthier lives, and yet our schools are resegregating, and these reformers don't care. That's not one of their issues. North Carolina and other southern states is now rushing headlong back towards a dual school system. We should not have the highest child poverty rate among the advanced nations of the world. This is a national scandal. Other nations have figured out how to protect the well-being of children and families and we don't even talk about it. We should talk, begin to talk about it. As for high stakes testing, we need to do more than pass resolutions. We should use the tests appropriately. We should stop using them to hand out rewards and punishments. Until they're properly used, until they're reined in, parents should opt out. Don't let your children take them. We should hire good teachers, we should support them, we should encourage their growth as professionals, we should allow them to teach, and we should evaluate them professionally. And yes, we must improve our schools. No, we must not privatize them. We should not hand them over to entrepreneurs and profit seekers. 
We should rebuild our cities, reclaim our towns and our villages by strengthening their public schools and their communities. Are we up to the challenge? Are we willing and able to rebuild our schools and rebuild our society? Right now, the money, the big money, is betting on privatization. They badmouth our public schools. They exaggerate their flaws. They slander dedicated teachers. They demean a profession that's vital to the future of our society. This is not a liberal agenda. This is not even a conservative agenda. Conservatives do not destroy democratic institutions. Conservatives don't try to eliminate local control of education. Conservatives don't attack local school boards. Conservatives don't embrace disruption for the sake of disruption. Privatization is a radical scheme. It's not a conservative scheme. The essential mission of the public schools is not to prepare workers. It's not to prepare young people for global competition. It's to develop citizens with the heart and the character to make good decisions for themselves, for their communities, and for our society. And this is a job that belongs to the community. It cannot be outsourced to private enterprise. So here are the keys to true school reform. Hope, not fear. Encouragement, not threats. Trust and respect, not carrots and sticks. Respect for, respect for students as individuals, respect for families, respect for teachers, belief in collaboration. The people of North Carolina need to know the truth. The schools are not failing. Public education is the foundation of our democracy. We must improve it, we must strengthen it, we must preserve it. If you care about the well-being of our children, the quality of education, and the future of our society, work with your fellow citizens to build good public schools in every neighborhood in North Carolina. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ravitch, for that uh, provocative and challenging message. We, ha we have time for just a couple of, of questions. Let me see what I have on green cards. To what extent do the National Common Core Standards and the curriculum that evolves from them constitute or align with what you call a substantive national curriculum? Well. I have been on the fence for a few years since they started the Common Core about whether I was for it or against it because I had urged the people when they started early on uh, developing them that they should field test it before they sent it out across the nation. And they said they didn't want to field test it. And then when I had a meeting at the White House in 2010 and I said the same thing, try it in three, or three to five states before you send it everywhere. And they said there was not time for that. And so I, but I said, I'll wait for the evidence. However, I wrote a column just a few weeks ago on my blog uh, where I said I can't support the Common Core Standards. And I know that I'm running against the tide, but I've run against the tide all my life, so why not now? Um, here's the reason I can't support them. The process is fundamentally flawed. You cannot create national standards by a small group and then impose it by dangling money uh, in 46 states without knowing how they work. We don't know whether these common core standards will make things better or worse. We don't know whether they will increase the achievement gap or narrow it. Um, because they keep talking rigor, 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 I wonder if they mean rigor mortis. Um, and I wonder if this will harm the children who are now struggling. Um, I'm very concerned because I've heard many people project or predict that the test scores are going to drop dramatically. And I've seen too many people in the corporate reform camp um, kind of rubbing their hands together and saying, oh boy, when those test scores go down, people will lose all faith in public education and there'll be an even bigger marketplace for all the stuff we're selling. So I worry about that because, um, because it strikes me that it will become just another nail in the coffin of our, uh, this vital public institution. Uh, I would. I think the Common Core would be fine if it was voluntary. It's not voluntary, though. It's being forced on 46 states simultaneously, and I think that's wrong. Uh, 
Public education is, as you say, under attack. What can parents do to fight back? Well, the best thing to do is to organize with other parents. I think um, when I was talking with students today, I said that the two most powerful groups today are students and parents because they have no, no, no money interest. If teachers complain, people say, there go the teachers again. They just have self-interest. They're greedy. You know, they, they just want to make big pensions and retire and, and have lifelong jobs and all the stuff they say about teachers. Um, but when parents organize and complain, the legislators have to listen. You're the voters. When students organize and speak out, they're the victims. <laughs> and so, since our society is all victims, so I think what's crucial is working with other people, mobilizing. You do have in this community Mecklenburg Acts. Uh, there's also a group called Public Education First NC .org, uh, which I, I read their posts from time to time. Uh, I just helped to create a group called the Network for Public Education. And the reason we did this is we want to network, literally network all these grassroots groups across the country so that they know that they're not alone. Um, because right now what's happening is that there's some incredibly wealthy people pouring millions of dollars into local and state school board elections in order to elect privatization-friendly um, candidates. And we can't possibly match their money, but we know there are very few of them, and there are many of us. So it's important that we inform the public about what's going on and get people to organize at the grassroots level to defend their democracy. And that's what we're hoping to do through uh, this uh, network for public education, using social media, using Twitter, Facebook, and all of the rest to um, inform the public about what's going on and to fight the money power. Simple as that. So what parents can do is join whatever grassroots groups you're aware of uh, that are feel as you do uh, that we're on the wrong track. There are so many good questions here, but in the interest of time, I regret we can have just one more. So keep the conversation going among yourselves, but we'll close with this question. Uh, Dr. Ravitch, you've talked about the importance of uh, increasing respect. What would respect for teachers look like at the local community level? Well, it would be, um, I mean, first of all, you have to have a climate of respect. And I know that you know, I'm talking to Maura and Raleigh, and I'm giving a different talk with all the same points, but it begin by, begins by saying, what do the great highest performing nations in the world, just if you look at the international scores, do? First thing they do is they have a strong public education system, no charters, no vouchers. Number two is they have a strong professional teaching profession. The teaching profession is respected, and, and the teachers are viewed like doctors, lawyers, architects, and other professionals by the community that community respect is very important. It's really hard to have community respect when you have your legislators and your Congress and the media constantly complaining about what bad teachers we have. That is ridiculous. We have wonderful teachers in this country. And you know, when I talk about the fact that the test scores are higher than ever, the graduation rates, that's about our teachers, but that's not the only thing. It's just that teaching is an incredibly difficult job. So when I, when I hear people complaining about teachers, I'm always either tempted to say, or I say, try it. See how long you'll last. It's not easy, it's a really hard job. And I think that if we could have more of the politicians walking in the shoes of teachers for, let's say, a week, all of this would stop. And we would then have, I think, the respect that teachers deserve, which is to be recognized as people who are doing an incredibly difficult job under very challenging conditions, dealing uh, often with classes that are, are beyond the capacity of the best teachers, but still managing to come back day after day. And when you ask them, would it help if you had merit pay? They say, no, I'm not here for the money. I'm here because I want to make a difference in the lives of children. That's what every teacher I've ever met says, I want to make a difference in the lives of children. And for their idealism, for their sense of mission, uh, they are not getting the return that they should get from the community which is, thank you, 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 thank you. As our time together in this room comes to an end, let me tell you what's gonna happen next.
Dessert will be served on three, count them, three levels. If you exit that way, there's dessert. If you exit that way, there's dessert. And if you go down one level, there's dessert. And uh, Dr. Ravitch is going to be at the lower level uh, at a book signing table where the death and life of the great American school system will be on sale and available for signing. Please linger and continue this good conversation with one another and with Dr. Ravitch. Thank you for being here tonight.